guys, what's up? My name is Jazzy Josh and you are watching the Talking Crap Podcast. As you can see, I'm on my own today because Lucas Jackson is in Malaysia. And I'm stuck here in rainy Essex. I think that's unfair, don't you? Anyway, <laughs> we didn't have an episode last week, so I'd like to apologise for our absence simply because we just had no time to release it, considering we would have had like an hour before release to record the news. Therefore, we decided to take a break and come back this week stronger than ever because unfortunately, not unfortunately, sort of, this will be the last news segment you get because after this episode, we're getting a weekly news show. Don't know why, we feel like it. We're cutting 10 minutes off of our episodes. You will have shorter episodes, all full of the content you are after and you can even watch your weekly news and keep up to date on all of the wrestling life. Uh, that being said, guys, we haven't got a name for it. So please drop them in the comments below. Post on Facebook. Tell us what you want us to name our weekly news show. Uh, as a heads up, it's on a Wednesday evening. So maybe bring that in. Just don't mention AEW because that would mean we're biased, which we're definitely not. But without further ado, let's get into the news. So first off, Karrion Cross has unfortunately had to relinquish his NXT title due to a separated shoulder he received in a match against Keith Lee this past NXT TakeOver 30. But it's not all bad news because we've got a fatal four-way match now this week coming up on Wednesday between Adam Cole, Tommaso Ciampa, Johnny Gargano and Finn Balor. And this will be the first ever fatal four-way 60-minute Iron Man match for a title in NXT, well, for any title, because there's never been a, a four-man, 60-minute Iron Man match before. But that being said, going back to Karrion Cross, he unfortunately did relinquish his NXT Championship after only just winning it in what was quite a somber promo. But after said promo, Scarlett Bordeaux, as always, left that sand timer thingy behind the championship, indicating that Karrion Cross's NXT title run may have come to an end for now, but he will get it in the future. Moving swiftly on, unfortunately in the wrestling world, deaths do happen. It happens in all forms of life. And unfortunately, the person that has kicked the proverbial bucket is that of Bullet Bob Armstrong. Uh, he died at the age of 80 just this past week due to bone cancer, I believe it was. Um, WWE released a statement saying they're saddened here as always and it's never a good thing but the Hall of Famer lives on in the, in, in the spirit of his four sons Road Dog, Scott Armstrong, Brad Armstrong and unfortunately I cannot think of the fourth one off the top of my head um, but let's cut that right there there's no need to carry on with sad news although I believe I am uh, in the sense of this past Monday night on Raw they had the Thunderdome as they have the week before at SummerSlam and at Friday Night SmackDown. But unfortunately, fans are being right dickheads, as they tend to be in the wrestling industry. And there have been signs of the KKK at the Thunderdome. Like, guys, come on. What the fuck are you doing? Like, in the nicest way possible, we don't say this word very often, but don't be a cunt. That is what you were being. So this past Monday night on Raw at the Thunderdome, a fan was seen on screen in a KKK robe. I have no words for this indescribable incident that should not have happened. That being said, I do have a quote from WWE um, with their thoughts on the situation. So here is a quote from the WWE on the situation at hand. This aberrant behavior does not reflect WWE's values and we have zero tolerance for these unacceptable acts. We are working to ban those involved from future events and per our policies, any inappropriate actions results in the removal from the live stream. This was a statement given to the New York Post just recently. Um, this isn't the only sign that we've seen and this isn't the only kind of, I wouldn't say inappropriate, but it's not the only thing that fans have put up. We've also seen appearances from Mario, Chris Benoit, and even a sign saying Fire Velveteen Dream. We will not get into that because that's been dealt with. Um, and we'll finish off on a high note, guys. Like, why not? And that is the fact that Wade Barrett made his return to NXT programming 
this past Wednesday night as a commentator. He's on the commentary team now. Um, it's un we're unsure if WWE will keep Wade Barrett in the loop. However, he is making another appearance at next week's Tuesday night event for NXT tapings due to the fact that, well, the NFL playoffs are coming up. So WWE will be moving NXT to Tuesday night next week and Wade Barrett will be part of the commentary team again. And well, that's the end of the news. Let's get right into the meat and gravy of the podcast. And you can listen to myself, Priscilla, Champagne Charlie and Lucas Jackson talk all kinds of crap about Chris Jericho. that concludes the news um and this week we are doing part two of the chris jericho episodes we're looking at the years basically the 2010s and onwards uh with chris jericho and we are joined again by priscilla later on but before that we are joined by champagne charlie that's why we've got two guests on this episode um and because we're doing the pipe one promo challenge we've always had to exclude priscilla from this as uh um he was part of last week part of promo we don't obviously want any influence. Um, so over to you, Mr. Porter, to explain the rules as it is part of promo challenge time. I mean, there's not much to explain to you, Charlie. You've already done a pipe bomb promo challenge, making it all the way to the finals in the last season. So there's only one way to find out if you make it to this finals this time. Um, right. Lucas, if I am correct, Champagne Charlie will be on your team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So what if we've evened it out now? We've both got two members on yeah. our teams, correct? Yeah. Well, you know the rules, so I'm going to give you a quick brief. Obviously, you get two topics, one being a place, one being a wrestler and or championship. Um, score out of 10, as usual. Okay. So, your two topics are, you will be facing Chris Jericho. Ooh. For the in WWE Intercontinental Championship at WrestleMania, your one minute starts now. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I have the opportunity to face one of the greatest of all time, the GOAT himself, Chris Jericho, for the Intercontinental Championship. Chris, I followed you all your career. You've been the Ayatollah. You've been the best in the world. You have the list of Jericho. But Chris, you have never faced the likes of me. You have never faced like the Northern Express, Champagne Charlie. And Chris, come WrestleMania, whether it be in the Performance Center or one of the big arenas, I'm coming for that championship, man. And you'll see me, Champagne Charlie, the Northern Express, the bigger, better deal become the new Le Champion. <laughs> and that, my friend, is something to worry about. It's true, my friend. Woo! Ooh, not <laughs> bad, not bad. Um, you were just shy of three seconds Ooh. out of time, so it's not bad. Um, Lucas, you went first last episode, so I will take it from here. Um, I mean, it all made sense. There's not really... The only thing I can deduct half a point for, because it was Fair enough, three half seconds, point that. was obviously the timing. But oh, other shit. than that... I mean, <laughs> it can't be too harsh. It was three seconds. Um, yeah, you can't yeah. be too harsh, because if I was there, I'd whoop your ass. So there we go. <laughs> well... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you mentioned WrestleMania, you mentioned the title, you mentioned loads of Chris's former... Gimmicks. I wouldn't yeah. quite go as far as say they were all separate gimmicks. They were just adaptations. There we go. Um, so I'm going to go with a comfortable four. Oh, so you the yeah. I can't deduct the half point for the three. Say so I think you know it's it's so close. Um, I I enjoy that promo. It's it's nice seeing his promos animated now, like it obviously face to face. Yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely. You know, it adds much more kind of into it. I'm I'm going to go quite high though. I'm just, I'm going to go four and a half. I thought that was really solid. Four and a half. Well done. 
Not bad. So out, the, what is this out of, is that, this out out of, of ten? Out of ten. Oh, out of ten. We right. do five points each. Oh, I see. oh, I get it. Okay. Yeah. Right. So at the end of that, you've got a respectable eight and a half. Okay. Which Nine means one. you are leading for Lucas's team. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> well, we'll find out what happens in the in the rest of the episode, won't we? Absolutely. Hey, that we've not recorded. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Well done for that, Champagne Charlie. Your Pipe Bomb promo entry is signed, sealed, delivered. We'll uh, see how that gets on very soon. We are joined, though, by another guest this episode. As Chris Jericho, Le Champion, is such a kind of diverse character, we're joined again by Priscilla, who joined us in part one. Uh, thanks for coming back, Priscilla. Hello, darlings. That's <laughs> right, listeners. You're not quite rid of me yet. Um, I'm a, you'll have to bear with me today, though, because my, my legs are a bit done. So I'm uh, currently on a lot of codeine and some ibuprofen, and my, and my head's on a different plane, which is kind of ideal for Jericho's last 10 years, because I feel like his head is on another plane as well. So, <laughs> so let's, uh, let's get to it. So Priscilla's high, and Champagne Charlie's drunk. <laughs> what a combination! <laughs> we're going oh, full WCW. Well, as soon as I was talking Jericho, I thought I'd open up a little bit of the bubbly to get. Why into- not? <laughs> <laughs> we are going to get to that. We are going to get to that, of course. I mean, so in the part one, we dealt with obviously Jericho's um, WWF debut, his WCW Cruiserweight days, um, and most of the two thousands. We're picking things up um, with his team, known as Jericho. One of us kind of series of teams that existed around this time um you know using this format just put together out of nowhere put together out of nowhere but jericho made it work i think um and jericho was very successful held the tag titles um and then led into a feud with edge so we're we're going with this kind of this like his last thing he did before he departed for a little bit of the company so we'll go to this like you know any kind of stand-up moments guys from the jericho era well, just well, the fact that he managed to make Big Show look good so many times was a pretty stand-up <laughs> moment in itself. And, <laughs> and this was around about the same time they were doing that those god awful you know guest host angles as well. They put yeah. Jericho in, in in a lot of angles with those. I mean, they had him be owned by eighty seven year old Bob Barker at one point, I think. So. Yeah, he got decked, didn't he, in the face? I think when. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I and then he got knocked out by Mike Tyson at one point as yeah. well. <laughs> Which, yeah. oh, and interesting... the guy from um, the Rammy the Ram as well. Was that all the same period when he when he jobbed to like three uh, of the old school guys in the Rarit Mania? Like, it was, it was he... close. I think that was just before teaming with Jericho, but it was round about when he was doing that whole best the best in the world thing. Yeah, so and improving yeah, it by yeah. getting his ass handed to him by a seventy-year-old. Yeah, by, <laughs> by, <laughs> yeah, by uh, Mickey Rourke. Yes. Yeah, so. yeah, that's it. <laughs> Well, yeah. the thing is, I think that all came along because he wanted to work with his childhood hero, Wiki Steamboat, who was at the time, I believe, was the uh, head, one of the trainers at the, at the at F- FTW, so I'm about to say the Performance Centre. We are that long ago. <laughs> where it, was, it was FTW, and he was one of the trainers, and Jericho wanted a chance to work with him. Um, and well, then originally, the I've, I've actually seen an interview with Jericho about that, how, how that whole setup thing happened. Because when Mickey Rourke, you know, laid the challenge because it it was Mickey Rourke who came up with the challenge first just by doing some interview but then he had to back out because Oscar season was coming up and they didn't like the idea of Mickey Rourke getting involved in it so it was Chris Jericho who pitched the idea of how about I face you know three legends the the deal was the deal was that every every legend had to be from Wrestlemania 1 you know Ah. the original the, the original lineup was supposed to be um you know, Piper, Snooker, and Valentine, Greg the Hammer Valentine. But all three of them pretty much, you know, couldn't do anything. You know what mm. I mean? So <laughs> it was Jericho who said, how about instead of Valentine, why don't we steamboat? Where did Mickey um, Walk fit into WrestleMania 1? Was he filling in for Mr. T or something? Pardon, pardon, what was that, sorry? So where did Mickey Rourke fit in with, with WrestleMania well, 1? Mickey Is he Rourke, like... Well, Mickey Rourke, it, 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 well, like I said, there was, there was originally supposed to be a match between Jericho and, uh, and Rourke, but then he backed out. So that's where the whole uh, 
WrestleMania one thing. Oh, so that was like a completely different plan that came. It was in, a completely like, different uh, thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but because Mark Mark was playing, you know, a legend who refused to let go. That's why they got the legends in because he was like portraying them. You know I mean? Legend that refused to let go, or also exactly, known as yeah. every wrestler over the age of thirty. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but you get to people like Snooker and uh, and Piper who were, who were put who were in their sixties at the time. So, yeah, I mean that was definitely twenty five. And obviously, the film just to clarify, we're talking about obviously uh, the wrestler, um, which yeah. obviously he was he, recently, recently then. Yeah, it came to a film. He won the Golden Globe, didn't he, for it? But he didn't win the Oscar. One of those weird kind of um, things that yeah. happen in Hollywood. But I think um, yeah, like and he yeah, he got in the ring afterwards, didn't he? Didn't he punch him out or something afterwards? Why is he yeah, getting punched out in like the air? But yeah, but after that, then became he was meant to team with Edge, but Edge got injured, which obviously added fuel to the fire for their feud and rivalry leading up to WrestleMania 26. Um, and believe it or not, yeah, I had to really think about this one. But WrestleMania 26, um, or the SmackDown after that, should I say, was the last time that Chris Jericho was a world champion in WWE. So 10 years mm. ago. Um, and obviously, he's had a long stint since then, which we're going to get to next. Um, but it's still quite remarkable. That's the last time he was a world champion in WWE. And then we think of Mania 26 someone... in general. Like I, I feel for him so much because he had to follow that god awful Bret Hart Vince McMahon match. Like Ooh. him, him <laughs> and Edge. If you put that match on without the sound, it looks like one of the best Mania matches of all time. It has Absolutely, all the moments, yeah. all the miracles. But the fact that Bret just stood there and wobbled around with a chair for like twenty five fucking minutes, like the crowd is dead for the mm. whole thing. And I really feel for him because they put on a clinic, but no one gives a shit because they all want to just cry. Yeah. yeah, if I was there, I probably would just would have just used that match to go get refreshments. To be honest, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think everyone was regretting not getting refreshments and then had to go and get them to like you know get some acid to burn their eyes out after seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing: you talk about Joko being champion at the time, you know, at the time, and he lost that belt in such an unceremonious fashion. Yeah, well, it being his last you know major world title reign with that company. It was he lost it to was it. Jack's Jack Swear now Jake Hager you know via yeah. you know uh, cash in yeah so which is a which is a grim way to lose it if you're a champion you know what I mean so. and he was he was as well I think obviously now we've got a lot of same night cash ins but Jack Swagger was a, was at the time the quickest person to cash in obviously SmackDown was taped back then um, yeah. Believe it or not, younger fans, it wasn't always live. Yeah. <laughs> it was taped back then, but so it was it was two days or four days depending on how you want to work these days, these numbers out. Um, and yeah, it was a big deal at the time. Like you know, and and one of the things we're going to get into definitely in the AEW section of, the, of this discussion, um, where Jericho has always been willing to kind of put over younger guys. I um, mean, he, he understood that at the time that the company were high on Jack Swagger, and which is weird a sentence to be saying in 2020 <laughs> when no one's high on Jake Hager. <laughs> Not even his MMA thing, are high on him. But here's the thing, though: Chris Jericho is one of those few, one of those select few wrestlers who realise they've got to get the next generation ready for, the, for all of there to be a business, you know, later down the line. That's the thing. You get so many, uh, you know, old school wrestler guys. Ah, he just knows that it's cool to be like that, isn't it? I know, but <laughs> who just want to hold on to their own spots. Yeah, no, I get that. I mean, the thing is, after this, um, you know, he, he leaves the company and he returned in 2012. And this was an interesting one because this was where everything kind of, he we thought would happen in this didn't happen so he returned with again cryptic promo we discussed this in the last episode in particular with the um you know save us campaign and the initial count of the millennium he's really good at these kind of returns it seems um and he returned and everyone kind of thought he was going to win the royal, the royal rumble match and he didn't win the royal rumble match no. um Sheamus won that match um he then went on to wrestlemania to face cm punk during obviously at the time we didn't know what we didn't know it would become the, you know, record-setting reign that it did end up becoming. But um, he faced CM Punk, and everyone kind of thought he was going to win. And then he didn't win the World Championship at WrestleMania. He left empty-handed. And then, you go. know, a very good feud. And I think there's some, some things I think he, he said as well. Like, he, they both envisioned the feud to be much darker in tone than it actually was. And a lot of ideas were rejected by the then PG, well, still PG company, but the PG company did agree. And there was a stipulation of one of the matches, um, I was reading this earlier, where the loser had to get a tattoo from the winner. 
and it was going to be live. Yeah, it was going to be a live segment on Raw. Um, oh, like, you know, oh, that would have been great. <laughs> yeah, that would but have been Vincent Mann said, no, you can't have needles. You know, he said, no, PG company, you can't have needles, can't have you know, blood, basically, take, you know, potentially. But um, obviously, it, it was planned to be a really kind of, because the promos for it really were quite strong. And obviously, they always do a good job of jabbing these things up, don't they? Um, they can they can either push a turd, as we say. But, um, you know, it ends up being, obviously, still a good feud, um, but not the kind of feud that I think needs, would need to elevate him to the next level. Um, I, Paul, I like, you've been quite silent so far. Like, Do you remember this feud with, with Punk? Um, was around the time you was probably getting into it. If I remember correctly, this is the one where... Um, so yeah, uh, where Chris Jericho went to smash a bottle over Punk's head, but instead slipped over. Yeah. And he also <laughs> poured, I think he poured whiskey on him or something. Like yeah, that, that, that yeah. was the bottle that he went to smash on his head, and then he yeah. slipped over the whiskey that he'd already poured. <laughs> he brought in a lot of personal elements with it as well, didn't he? Yeah, like, that, that's what I liked about it. Like, personally, I hate the idea of using someone's personal demons against them in Absolutely. a storyline, but... It was one of those ones that really worked for it. I think because Punk has always been outspoken in that. He's, yeah. He's happy to kind of talk about this and he's used the straight edge stuff very, very well. I'd argue more so, well, definitely more than anyone, anyone else really. But he's used that backstory, I think, very well. And then Chris um, and comes in man. and throws it in his face. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to, to a sense. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, interesting. I, Go Sorry, on. it's interesting you say about not um, using the demons against people because something I've pitched many times to promoters is doing a story where um, I get essentially stripped of the Priscilla gimmick and told you've got to become more serious in order to become like a get a title shot or something and mm. then tell the story of making the choice not to do that. Like essentially come out in normal gear but refuse to win a match because yeah. it's not who I am. And um, a yeah. lot of, they always throw away from it. But for me, it's a story I've always wanted to tell because it's very true and very real, and I know the emotion will be there. But but I guess it's that thing, like when you write an autobiography, it's like you get your demons out. You ate, you yeah. own it because you yeah, say, cause this is what's affected me. Lucas, the written word is so much more harsh, I find. So... Hmm. Yeah, yeah, but then if you actually act it out for real, it's like it's almost like having a movie of your life done, but you're physically like you yeah. physically fight it when you're in the ring. So it's um, I th you know I, I think if somebody's up for it, I think it's sometimes the most powerful story. But CM Punk has told that story so many goddamn times now that I don't really care that much. But yeah, you know. exactly. So <laughs> well, yeah, I think with these kind of things, if it's your story though, and it's your truth to tell, I think no matter what it is, it always can it always should be able to resonate more of an audience. And I think, you know, this feud in particular, like it was, you know, it has some dark elements to it, but I think if WWE, I think if it did now, they would probably be like, okay, right, let's give it what we needed to give. But at the time they weren't too keen on it. And then obviously, like we said, we're going to touch on this, this, going to come, this point I think I've come, come quite a lot. So excuse me, like what you're repeating, but obviously the loss to Fandango at Mania 29, um, forgotten loss this one I think forgotten match I think um, yeah. by a lot of fans it certainly um, seems again, that way it, you know, I, re I like... read Jericho's book about this and it was something he wasn't he wrote a book on one match Jesus <laughs> well, no, but, yeah, I, I, yeah, how long was this Fandango match <laughs> <laughs> I, think I think it's in the third book I think you know, <laughs> but he talks about you know um, this match with Fandango and he just really wasn't happy with it at all yeah it's just it, a real a throwaway match it was he it. just does his normal stuff. It was kind of lackluster, shall we say. That's the word I was thinking of. The, don't get me wrong. Fandango and Chris Jericho, I reckon, could put on like a stellar match. Mm. But that one wasn't it. Even, the even with either of them losing. The problem I think they had is that it was Fandango's debut match. Hmm. And no one knew who the fuck Fandango was. Exactly. Unless you so watch NXT. Is, so like, if it's say, for instance, Chris Jericho with AJ Styles for the first time together, like we knew what AJ Styles does and how he's he wrestles, capable of, yeah, and what he's capable of, but we don't know what the fuck Fandango is. All we had seen of him before was the weird Johnny Curtis skits, you know. Yeah, and, that, the only yeah. reason no I'm one knew who Fandango well, was reality <laughs> show version of NXT. Yeah, he, yeah, Fandango was a relatively new gimmick. It was Johnny <laughs> Curtis beforehand. So everyone's like, but he was a this guy? We'd about? only seen him dance a couple of times. That was literally <laughs> all we knew about Fandango. And like, I was well excited for it when it happened. But um, 
so I like breaking down matches a lot and trying to work out the secrets of these guys so I can copy their shit. And um, <laughs> Jericho has a very specific series of things that he does in his matches at certain points. And normally you don't really notice it because the series of things he does, they vary so much that you're still going, oh, wow, into that, into that, into that. But if you watch like five of them in a row from the same year, it's almost always really similar. Almost With like the Fandango... Yeah. Yeah, so like the Fandango match, it's like you're waiting for the cool Fandango stuff to drop in, but mm. all he had was a fucking leg drop. That was literally <laughs> it. So there's like, it's really obvious that all you're watching is Jericho on autopilot and Fandango going, da 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 da, this is as good as it ever gets for me. Mm. And <laughs> that was the end of Fandango. Nice to see you ringside for Tyler Breeze matches. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but Jericho, you know, he's still, he still, he has been a fan, I guess, of doing the job, I guess, um, in a nice possible way, and the, it, it comes up a lot in this section, really. Um, and obviously, one of my favourites from this kind of first period of return was when he feuded with Bray Wyatt, and he had an excellent cage match from Raw in probably 2013, 2014, um, and that was another personal feud that he did at the time. Um, but I think, obviously, what we're, now what we're going to move into now, it probably is better of the of the last part we've done the rework it's got to break me down with jericho so many, so many times but obviously he's been essentially a part-time wrestler isn't he since since about 2014 he's had since his return he kind of he would you know he'd, he'd leave and then come back and then leave and, and he'd come go back. off and do tours with fozzy you know, with fozzy yeah, yeah. That, was, um, that was around the time that fozzy actually kind of blew up well, yeah, I mean, obviously, he's outside work. Obviously, he's got loads of that. The Talker Show, the yeah. podcast, he's been in films and t TV shows, et cetera. Books. But, I mean, yeah, books. He, he likes writing books. <laughs> Especially Bobby if it flopped when they first came around. Like, when he first left WWE is when he went off to tour with, or, well, performed with Fozzy. It was just a massive flop for no reason. But they come back a few years later, exact same band, exact same music, and for some reason they blow up. It's just a matter of timing, I guess. And I think, I think it's it the was, same thing yeah. in wrestling, though. It's like, you know, some wrestlers, one hit, one or two years out, you wouldn't get the same results, would you? But I mean, Same so, storyline, could work yeah. different times of the year. Mm. I mean, yeah, he's better work, I feel. And I think mm. the contenders really is the, later, the latter half of his last WWE run. So... Obviously, we're kicking things off with the Y2 AJ stuff and the feud with AJ Styles leading up to WrestleMania. And obviously, we, it includes a lot of stuff in this. So it's like, this is when he introduced, obviously, the scarf and the fit. And, you know, leading up to a lot of stuff, which we're going to get to in, and probably digest a bit more. But obviously, I think his better work came at this time. I think the excited, the excitedly of seeing, like, you know, uh, Chris Jericho and AJ Styles, you know, team together and then feud together. I think that was fantastic. I say um, team in the in the shortest sense because it really didn't last. It lasted like <laughs> it one, one match. Yeah, yeah t-shirt. He had, he had a t-shirt, but like I said, that that was very lackluster as well because it only lasted a week. I think <laughs> it was just a merch thing, like a, a dream match kind of situation. Was all it was. Yeah, yeah, but it made me so frustrated, though, because, like, AJ Styles, you know, when I started um, around about the same time AJ debuted, which is why I'm obviously just as talented. And um, <laughs> I wasn't joking. I don't know why anybody's laughing at that. <laughs> but, yeah, um, he, like, it really frustrated me that AJ, after all these years, like, um, coming on, like, 15-odd years when we've been waiting for him to come to WWE, and most people, including himself, were like, yeah, it's never going to happen. And then it does happen, and it's, like, brilliant. And he has his debut match... Uh, Royal Rumble smashes it, has his match with Jericho, obviously really excited, great match, did an amazing job. And then, instead of going on to other dream matches, because I literally would see AJ work any person on that roster and I'd have been on the edge of my seat, we got three solid months of just him and Jericho in the ring. Like, there was never a time where you didn't see both of them in the ring at the same time. And don't get me wrong, it was great matches. Every one of them were great matches, but I really was excited for AJ to hit everybody. And then he went on and wrestled Cena every bloody week for the next few months as well. So it was, oh, mate, I just, I wanted to see him against everyone. And I saw him against one person on repeat, and it did my head in. Nothing against Jericho, just against It's like, um... Do you remember the Rey Mysterio Andrade feud, where like every um, other, um, every other week <laughs> it was Rey Mysterio versus Andrade, and it was ridiculous. 
Yeah, I mean, WWE, they do this quite a lot, um, where they just go into rematch overdrive. And um, it's happened, or Jericho's had, had a few of this. It was same with the Bray Wyatt feel, looking at it, like, oh, he actually had about six matches with the Wyatt family, in, you know, within one month. And it was that weird period where they were just overdoing matches all the time on television. Yeah, that's um, of... like, what was it, Del Rio versus Randy Orton happened, something like 300 and something odd times <laughs> in the space of a couple of years. It's just insane. But I, I yeah. guess when they get a good match, they're like, that's a safe one. Yeah, brilliant. Just put that back on again, because you don't have to worry about that 10 minutes then. Yeah, I, I mean... I mean Sorry, I'm, with Chris Jericho though, I remember when he came back uh, and announced that he was going to be in one of the uh, the Royal Rumbles. I think this is about 2014, I think. This is when he started doing the whole light-up jacket thing, you know, and um, I remember he, he started doing like some of his like kind of old-school promos where he added comedy into it. I mean, mm. I, think, yeah, I think at one point he called the New Day Trap Queens or something like yeah. that. And, yeah. 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 And there was another, there was another time when... Um, you know, when they did that angle of Stephanie McMahon getting arrested, he came out and started singing the tunes of cops, you know, the whole yeah. bad boys, bad boys, <laughs> what you gonna do, what you gonna do when we come for you, yeah. Uh, and now yeah. we've got a copyright strike. <laughs> <laughs> you can edit um, that out. <laughs> Um, but yeah, 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 yeah. Not for the copyright strike, though. Just for, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll censor um, it. I think, yeah, like, obviously, he had a lot of stuff in this. I mean, the main thing in this last factor is the Kevin Owens relationship. And, oh, and, and the list of Jericho. The list, the scarf, um, the 69 thumbtacks, the Ambrose Asylum. There's, there's, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, and, you know, the Kevin Owens feud was the reason, well, the culmination of it is the reason why he said that he left WWE for... Because Vince hated it. He hated the he, match. What he believes was the fun, what is at the moment the final time, but as we know, we never said ever with Jericho. Um, but never no, said never in wrestling in general. The original programme was obviously that Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho had been working together for a year, basically, um, as partners, and they had the festival of friendship, and Kevin Owens was a, uni- was a universal champion. And the original plan for Mania was that Jericho would beat Kevin Owens, the main event, for the Universal Championship. It then changed, as we know, to Goldberg and Lesnar having the uh, World Championship match, the Universal Championship, and Owens and Jericho feuding for the United States Championship and going on second. Um, and Jericho says that that's the reason why he left that debris. He felt that, you know, because believe it or not, he's only had one Mania main event. We touched upon this on the last uh, episode, I believe. Yeah. He only had H. one Mania main event against Triple H back at WrestleMania, WrestleMania uh, 18. Um, but this was like, I guess he's going to be, he probably thought it being his final chance to get that main event. It didn't happen. Um, and I think personally it was a wrong decision. Um, as much as I'm a fan of that Lesnar and Goldberg match, I feel that having the kind of rug swept under... You know, swept from on your feet last minute must have been disheartening. Um, definitely for um, Jericho. Oh, a fun um, fact about that Goldberg and Brock Lesnar match. Brock Lesnar was actually meant to win and beat Goldberg as like a making up for his loss at WrestleMania 21. But Lesnar actually suggested and up. outright refused to win, but suggested that he'd get beaten by Goldberg in 90 seconds or less. Yeah, that was for the, yeah, for the first match, yeah. Yeah, um, I found that but, quite bizarre. Well, it made box office in the end. You yeah. Because obviously the, the end did. result was good. But, well, it was good for Brock Lesnar and good for <laughs> Goldberg. But sadly not good for um, Owens and Jericho. Obviously went from a main event match at Mania to on second for United States Championship. Yeah, using um, the Saudi special. <laughs> um, oh God. But yeah, I mean, what are your thoughts, guys? Like, what do, you, do you think that Kevin Owens and Jericho should have had the United States? Universal Championship Absolute, contest. Absolutely, because it was a great uh, build-up. But you know what Vince is like. Vince is all about you know the bigger uh, deal. You know the bigger guys and the guys he thinks is a bigger draw. The, the problem is Vince McMahon's brain is still back in the 1980s when things when those when the when big guys were still the draws. So he doesn't realise what fans actually want this day and age. 
Nah, not being funny, mate. Not being funny. But they are. <laughs> it's, it's a huge call for a company. They've got people doing stats and reports all the time on their ratings. They know full well who gets who breaks the bank just because all of us who talk about it online don't like it. Like we're not the majority uh, consuming this product at the end of the day. Like Kevin Owens, Chris Jericho, like um, for a wrestling fan is massive. But like. You know, we've been talking about it all the way through here. Jericho's been the career putting over the young guys guy. Like, he always has the best match on the card, but he's not the superstar of the show. Like, Lesnar versus Goldberg, that is a WrestleMania main event. Chris Jericho versus Kevin Owens, to, to someone who hasn't watched wrestling in five years, it's not going to be a reason to get the network for another month. It's, sorry, who are these guys? Actually, I'm too busy at work. I'm, I won't bother looking it up. Like, you know... They, they had great chemistry, amazing chemistry, but I don't think they really sold it as like, like WrestleMania main event needs to be that like undoubtable Rock versus Cena one time only, or maybe Rock versus Cena one time only again. It's got to be that kind of, oh my God, like I've got to buy a ticket because I'll miss out on this. It was Jericho and Kevin Owens, we'd literally seen it every week for a year. So it's not like a special one-off occasion. Um I mean, the match was much better. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> it's much more enjoyable. But, um, but I think in terms of like ratings and what actually sells tickets and, and what looks like a big draw, like those two monsters squaring off looks more of a main event any day than Jericho versus Backyard Dude in his baseball shorts. It's just and, like, but yeah. Basically, it's just two guys who are well, one of them who's well past their prime. You know, trying to cling on to a spot. Hey, Lesnar's like, all right. Yeah, it's Gold <laughs> comparing Goldberg and Lesnar is like comparing the Tyson and Jones Jr. match that's supposed to be happening very soon. So, oh, but Tyson is never out of shape. No, so, yeah. I mean, I think, I think, yeah. Like, it's a hard, it's a difficult one because there was two very di distinct camps that exist with this. There's the wrestling camp because, yes, I want to see Owens and Jericho wrestle for 20 minutes. Then there is a, the, the smart fan and investor cap of like, well, Brock and Goldberg, you know, they're going to make money. But Jericho, like we said, he, he, he says this was the reason why he decided to leave. And his final appearance was at the greatest, the greatest Royal Rumble uh, back in, Saudi Arabia. Um, in Saudi Arabia. And he has not worked for the company since. Um, and since he signed for All Elite Wrestling, they removed him from the um, signature of the show, which is a typical Dick McMahon move, I'd say. Um, this is where he finds ourselves now. So we're talking about New Japan All Elite, All Elite Wrestling. So, you know, well, Jericho well, his, is well, probably the, the biggest star in the AW at the moment, isn't he? Well, his stint in Japan, he did uh, Japan and then he did... Then he did the greatest uh, Royal Rumble because it was like a one in between thing, and then he yeah. did it full time. Yeah. I remember watching that uh, you know clip; it went viral on YouTube when he showed up in Japan to challenge Kenny Omega. I think it was for their uh, their US title, their Intercontinental. Time. I'm sure it was their in all, it was their US one. You know, I've, they, had, they had this red John, strap. One. John Moxley won the United States title, and um, and then. Jericho won the Intercontinental title. Yeah, Jericho won the Intercontinental title, but if you remember his match with Kenny Omega that he had in Japan, he lost. And that oh, was, and that was for, the, for Omega's US title. Yeah, I remember that. Um, because um, come for Charlie, Josh, he'll fuck you up. Because <laughs> <laughs> Jer Jericho is the first person to hold the WWE Intercontinental and, title. And IWGP Intercontinental title. Yeah. yeah. Now, not yeah. the only one, but the first one. He, he's still, so, yeah. He's still sort of making appearances for New Japan. Yeah. I think we, we, you know, we can't yeah, because he had that he had that match with Tanahashi a few months back. So yeah, but obviously New Japan's now well, great. AEW have a very good um, relationship with other companies, except WWE, yeah. of course. So yeah. that and I, their contracts are exclusive, but only to an extent. So say yeah, someone no, yeah. goes, "Can I work here for a match?" Be like, "Yeah, sure." Can I win a championship here? No, no, definitely not. I think someone like Jericho's got a very bespoke deal because obviously, like we yeah, said, he's got his outside stuff. So if he wants to do a fuzzy tour, he'll, he'll go and do that. If he wants to go and do his pod, he wants to do his podcast nonstop, <laughs> then he can go and do that. Um, and, um, if he wants to drag the whole roster onto a ship and then do a concert for <laughs> yeah. them where they can't the, leave the, and he can't yeah, get yeah, away. That's the thing with the Jericho <laughs> rock and raving wrestling cruise. I don't know. There's so many R's <laughs> in it. Um, yeah. But um, the thing with that, with that cruise is it's very AEW branded now. 
to... Yeah, I don't know if they bought the rights to it, yeah. perhaps, or... I don't think they bought the rights to it, but I think they're a sponsor. Okay, but that, that, that makes sense. That, that's his main yeah. employer. Yeah. You know, that, that, that makes sense. Um, and it's something different. That's I think, on my bucket you know, for another kind of episode, but I think definitely, like, seeing... I think seeing wrestling done in different locations is always something that's interesting. And particularly now, when obviously a lot of it is done for an at-home audience, it's good to have different visuals. But in AEW, like Jericho has been batshit. I, I, I couldn't think of another way to say it. Like, I think as much as he's been entertaining and really, you know, really, really, really quite a strong drawing point to the brand, especially for people who obviously would come from WWE watching it to watch AEW, um, I think he's been insane. Like, <laughs> um, as much as I've enjoyed with the champion and obviously a little bit of the bubbly, and now he's doing the demo god stuff. I haven't seen too much of AEW recently. Um, feud you know, last thing Orange I saw Cassidy. was the Orange Cassidy, Matt Hardy, yeah. and you know, having feuds with people teleporting yeah. and stuff and stadium stampede. And, the, and the, <laughs> when, during the lockdown, you know, the whole the bubbly club, you know, the uh, those little uh, you those vids they did. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> The bub, uh, the bubbly so, boys I mean, or something. The bubbly club. Was it the bubbly club? <laughs> oh, the bubbly bunch. That's it. The bubbly, bunch. bubbly it, boys. The bunch. It was. A, it took a look at the... <laughs> if he wants to get, if he wants to get Bubba and Devon back together for like a one-off. I think the bubbly boys could be <laughs> part of that stable. But Why here's not? the thing, let's talk about the inner circle. What do we make of the uh, of his choices? You know, for it, for that group. What, as in, like the members? Um, yeah, the members, you know, because um, when, you, when you form a faction, it's important that you get all the key elements. Right. In it, so. I think Sammy Guevara and Jake Hager, it'll do them a lot of good. Absolutely. Sammy Guevara mainly because he's not massively known, or at least he wasn't and when he joined AEW. It's also, also like you, you, he has the youth, so it's like the future yeah. star kind of thing. And he's a skinny little runt, so he needed someone big and strong to back him up. Uh, Jake Hager, mainly in the sense of no That's one really likes him that much in WWE anyway. So how is he going to make an impact in AEW? Um, in regards to uh, Proud and Powerful, Ortiz and Santana, I think they do good for the Inner Circle. Like, but I don't think the Inner Circle does them any good. Mm. I think they'd have been a lot better well, off on their I own. Think they already established tag team LAX. Exactly. Those, like they spent um, a lot of time. They, people know who they are. Yeah, they spent a lot of time in Impact Wrestling as LAX with the rest of LAX, not just as a tag team. But then they yeah. go, they break off from Conan and Impact Wrestling and go to AEW as a tag team, and then somehow, some way, end up in another faction. <laughs> like well, AEW they, is very faction heavy. Yeah, they are. Like they're they're like, not in a bad yeah. situation. Like it's not doing them any neg it's not doing them negatively, but I don't think it's doing them any good. But other than that, I think, I think the inner circle are pretty good. I mean, I think the inner circle obviously it, it was something that needed to happen because they wanted hmm. people to feud with the elite. Yeah, um, exactly. And you know, it is a bit of circumstance. I think obviously we touched upon Sammy Guevara. I think it was last week, um, Priscilla. We had some comments about Sammy Guevara. He's obviously oh yes, yeah, little he's Sammy G. Up. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the match when we have it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, yeah, he's fucked up, but, you know, I think Jericho, again, it's his way of working with the younger, I guess. I mean, Jake Hager, I mean, let's face it, I think the ship's passed, sadly, in my opinion. But I think... Um, I think he Hager, just needs to go to MMA and just smash it out there, because he's, he's really there good. Muscle, though, isn't he? He's there as the big... Yeah. Yeah. Like, he can't talk for anything. <laughs> And Jericho um, killed his catchphrase. Yes, exactly. Like, and he it, had for him that like, even we the people sucked and buried. <laughs> yeah, he killed it. It's like fuck's sake, Jericho. Like Hager can just about put on a match. Like don't get me wrong, he's not bad, but he's not great. I no. think Hager's got a really good future as like a doorman somewhere. He's quite an intimidating <laughs> guy, isn't he? Like, he, he, I just think he's he needs gonna, to get serious. He's going to yeah, be my, a security my, guard. My, my local are currently hiring for a bouncer, so there we there go. There we go. There <laughs> we go. Yeah, you're listening, Jake. You're dropping a call. <laughs> yeah. So Park, what? Park Tavern, South End on Sea. <laughs> <laughs> so where are we seeing this going, lads? Like. Jericho, obviously, he can be 50 years old this year and be celebrating... He already 30. is 50. He celebrated it recently. Did he? Um, okay. Well, he is yeah. 50. Oh, well, there we go then. Okay. Well, he is 50 then. He's, he is 50 years old now. Fair enough. And celebrating 30 years in the business this, this October. Like, you know, is 
AEW, where you see him retiring? Or did he go back to WWE to have kind of one well, last match? He, he, maybe he was he'll... About him, there was rumours about him speculating of retiring, and that's the reason why I think they also put him on a broadcasting recently, just because, you know, it's like a, some people, when wrestlers retire, either they either go into managing or they go into, uh, you know, uh, an outfit, but and he really did a good job. They, with, they, with they'll end on. up as commentary manager or backstage of some form. At some form, if they've not gone into movies or found God in some Or way. just bugging up. Oh, God. Exactly. Yeah. But, well, look uh, at DDP, for example. He's now a yoga instructor with his own brand and everything. Like, he doesn't... Yeah. He's not but been he's involved in wrestling. With wrestling, you know, like, your know, appearances. Like yeah, like, but then again, most re- retired wrestlers... No one retired, they'll, No, no one really retires. They'll disappear for a couple months, then make a magical appearance somewhere. Well, Sting's, Sting's got his own church now. I don't think Sting's coming back Has anytime he? soon. Yeah, Sting, like... Yeah, so yeah, when he was... born again, didn't he, so... Yeah, man, there's the really dreadful movie about Sting's life, which he um, stars in his life. It is awful, isn't it? There's an autobiography that came with it as well, a 100-page um, Ladybird book-style autobiography, <laughs> which just puts over the movie. And it's basically, he, um, after realising that his career was going nowhere, he found God and was like, right, I'm going to become a pastor, and like does <laughs> like... I, I think he did a few religious wrestling shows as well as part of it. But um, anyway, uh, no, no, it's not. <laughs> He's trying to make it a thing, but it's not. But like, I, I feel like this AEW thing, like, and maybe this is just me being a grumpy, bitter, I'd, I'd say veteran, but you have to have achieved something to be a veteran. But anyway, grumpy, bitter and old for the business. Like, I feel like AEW is going to be like a long, but a flash in the pan, like a long flash in the pan. But it all it is, is a bunch of, angry middle-aged guys going oh, i didn't get the opportunities i wanted which is fine when you create something positive but every time i switch on AEW, all they do is they go wwe and it makes them look bitter and jealous yeah because the, the fact like, like, with, with, with Brody lee do it doing the like the vince mcmahon jokes you know what i mean mm. don't, don't sneeze in front of me that kind of thing and it seems that since obviously Jericho left for WWE, he's been very vocal about stuff. Obviously, definitely in that last run that we touched upon. Obviously, he left, he left because of the Owens thing. He's um, obviously giving he gives a lot of commentary and comments about current WWE events. And so it's a bit like, you know, is he hurting his chances, or does he kind of know that with respect? There's enough people in that locker room that will kind of vouch to have him return to the company. Um, and he's probably in with quite a few of the kind of. Um, Oh, look, mate, uh, short, short of NWO, no one has ever gone after WWE as much as Jericho has in recent years. Like, <laughs> yeah. Punk has a bit of a reputation for speaking out, but he spoke out on what, like, two podcasts? Jericho's yeah, done it every week for the last couple of years to, and made money from it. So, uh, I'm not sure. Here's what happened. <laughs> I remember because here's, here's, here's an, an example of all the stuff he's done, you know, taking the piss take out of WWE since he's been in AEW. Um, yeah, you know, he came up with that lexicon, if you remember, which is basically oh, yeah. the list. You know what I mean? He did that. <laughs> and then there was one time where him and the inner circle, they're in the, uh, the like one of those private boxes. Yeah, know, they're like the, 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 down the Cody. Boots. At one point, MGF comes out and goes, oh, so I'm supposed to be scared of a guy with a scarf? Who wears a scarf? You know, that's <laughs> like, you know, taking the mick out of himself in a way, but... I guess you know, we, we are in a way. Yeah, I guess we are jabs. in a way. We are on the way just at these, he has a phase though where I think, you know, he's having fun with wrestling. And so that's what, this is what makes it hard to determine when he retires. Because I think if he can kind of do AW a little bit, go and do Fozzy, go and do a movie, come back, do AW a little bit. And let's be honest, like he's, he's not as hard hitting now, you know, with uh, the in-ring stuff as he was, you know, in, back in his prime. He's, do, mm. he's taking less bumps. He's not doing a lot of... Um, yeah. He's not doing too much, you know, physicality. So is it a case of just whenever he decides, you know, that's it, I'm the stop? But, I don't I mean, think he's in any hurry to retire, but I also don't think he'd mind if he did. I, yeah, because it, I think but for he, me, he it seems love himself. So Yeah, it, at the moment, it seems like all of his careers, because let's be honest, he's definitely got plenty of cash. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you see those promos he does at his house. Exactly. So, like, yeah. You can't uh, have that kind know. of house and run... Um, a cruise with tickets exactly. being like fifteen hundred pounds a person. Cruise ship, so 
He owns the ship. Yeah. And the tickets mm. to get on it are 1,500 quid. 1,500 mm. <laughs> for one person. I'd probably have to sell one of my kidneys in order to get a ticket. Yeah. That, honestly, so, yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I don't think all of it, all of the things he does as a career are now just hobbies for him. He's not yeah. doing it to make money. He's doing yeah. it because it's something he enjoys. And he's having fun. Like when he was doing commentary, he did it because he was enjoying it. You know, yeah. working, working with Tony Schiavone and taking the piss constantly. <laughs> you know, it's just, um, oh, one thing I love that he did, he did a, a, there was a segment he did last year. It was just after he beat Cody. Right, it was uh, him and MJF, and they were having this back and forth. And this is the kind of guy Jericho is. He loves bringing a bit, a bit of nostalgia. He said, you know, there are some similarities between us. He goes, it's kind of, it kind of, basically, I kind of think that your parents got horny twenty five years ago whilst that whilst they were watching me on WCW Saturday <laughs> Night beating the crap out of Lucha <laughs> Guerrera, and then nine months later, your little twerp ass popped out. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> Only Jericho could come yeah. up with something like that. So, but I think in a way we're all kind of of the same kind of opinion. Then, like we we don't know. Like he's kind of having fun, and I guess that's it. And I guess you know we're wrapping this up now. Like I think ultimately, you know, Chris Jericho is a person who has had many chapters, and is someone who we don't know how many are left, um, but we know there could be quite a few. And so there could even be a part three to this in a few years' time when we're talking about Chris Jericho going to Impact Wrestling, yeah, a place where he's never been. <laughs> The Chris Jericho has there. bought Impact with, Wrestling. With, uh, <laughs> with Jericho, with the, with the only exception of The Undertaker, Jericho is the only wrestler who's managed to you know, re revamp himself constantly and keep himself modern and refreshed. The thing is, Chris you know, Jericho the and The Undertaker can both take a gimmick and run with it. They've never had a really, a really bad gimmick. Like, it's, a it's always though. worked for them. With a, there's a difference though. With the Undertaker, he kind of went full circle with it because he started off with the Dead Man and built that, then went into the whole American badass thing, but then kind of circled back round and came Ooh. back into the whole Dead Man thing again. Undertaker with, never really changed his gimmick. Really, yeah. he, he whilst he with adapted Jericho, it. he keeps adding on new stuff, yeah. you know, and changing it for the better. Do you know what I mean? So. Mm. It's really a, a different dynamic there between the two. But both of them, their gimmicks have never really gone. They've always just been slightly different to what they were two years ago. But with, yeah, with, but with Chris yeah. Jericho, though, he did can change completely at one point. Because then when he started doing that whole best in the world thing where he started wearing suits and was just serious all the time. But he was, was still a, that, that was he was still Chris Jericho. Thing. Like He didn't change his moveset. He didn't change his. He didn't necessarily change his style. He just became a more serious version of what he was the year prior. Hmm. Yeah, he, look, his, I mean, um, he changed his moveset yeah. for AEW when he did that god awful yeah. spinning Dude, back elbow that. as a finish. So. Right, Dude, you say that. it's a god awful spinning back elbow. However, I have seen multiple people in MMA being knocked out cold with that elbow. But well, it's it's a lot. No, I know, so. but it, it's still a legit move that could. Yeah, be well, done. a legit move is sticking my finger in your ribs, and so you go, "Ah, oh, stop!" But nobody's going to pay <laughs> to see that. Well, not <laughs> outside of like Pornhub or something. I bet. I bet if Pete <laughs> Dunne did it, they would. <laughs> that's Pornhub true. Mentioned. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, well, there's another the copyright that is, that, that, is, that, is, that is the joke of the show, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I think a, a great way to um, end what's been two weeks, two episodes of uh, talking about Jericho, and um, yeah. I've enjoyed it. Yeah, um, <laughs> absolutely. <It's been> possible. <laughs> <laughs> thanks uh, to Priscilla and thanks Champagne Charlie for joining us. Um, we are the, we are back um, next week with uh, more talking crap. Until then, everyone stay safe, have a lovely time. We'll see you on the other side. Thank you. See you Bye. soon. Take it easy.